topic is needs analysis, which is indeed a very broad topic. Uh, and what I last night I was in a keynote role, and uh, and that's kind of fun and interesting. But the downside of that for me is brief time, say a lot of general things, uh, and not be able to follow up and follow through on some things that I feel strongly about. And, and obviously spent some time thinking about it. And I know from the questions that came up last night uh, over drinks, there were some very thoughtful questions that I didn't have a chance to address uh, in the time we had together. And today we're kind of in that, in that same spot with these time constraints. What, what I'd like to do this morning is just talk to you as one training professional to another about, about needs analysis, about a particular perspective on needs analysis that I have that's evolved over over the years. Uh, you people obviously do a lot of needs analysis yourselves, uh, given the progression that, that Brian talked about last night. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to share with you another approach, an approach that's not going to be applicable all the time, but I think is, uh, is fair to try and approximate in, uh, in many cases. So that's, that's the general way I'd like to, to approach this morning. I'm going to work off transparency, same as last evening, and you should have hard copy of all the transparencies as, uh, as we go along. I mentioned last night that, uh, from my vantage point, the objective of training is to improve individual and organization performance. In that context, then, needs analysis, as far as I'm concerned, is to, uh, the role of needs analysis is to establish the link between the training input and the performance output. It's one thing to say that, it's another to try and build that linkage. And that's what needs analysis is about, is can we in fact link training to performance output? And I want to present a framework for thinking about and seeing that linkage. So a concern here really is in establishing the link between training input and performance output. So I'm going to present that framework with you, to you. I want to suggest a basic process that uh, we found useful and uh, a number of organizations that we've worked with have found useful in looking at certain kinds of, of, uh, of training needs. And to illustrate that with an example and uh, have some time for some questions. Now, I want you to note that the model I'm going to present is a model for determining training needs and performance needs, uh, being consistent with, with last night. So, a basic framework, suggested process, and uh, and an example. <coughs> and to kind of start this, I'd like to talk for a minute about the training request, which is in fact what comes at us all the time and reflects our needs analysis. As uh, was said this morning, the foundation, the starting point for training is in this needs analysis and, and doing it correctly. <coughs> Okay. In a sense, when people come to us with training needs or training requests, what they seem to be saying is, see that performer out there? Say, yes. And they say, terrific, fix them. And you say, fix them in what? You say, well, fix them in communications, fix them in this, fix them in that. And the whole assumption seems to be, with that kind of a view, and I want to talk about two views, but the, the, the assumption behind that view seems to be that performers kind of exist in a vacuum. They hang out there in a white space. And what we're going to do is come in and put some knowledge skill in their head, and they're going to be fixed. All right? And we got ourselves basically then, in this view, the performer hanging in white space and we've got ourselves an input orientation to needs analysis. Now, to me, when someone says, see him out there, fix him, I have a different view. And this is what I would call a performance context view of this trainee. The first is, what I know is that every trainee is, in fact, a performer for real. All right, in the real world. And I know that that performer, this is kind of the blue view of the world, I know that that performer is expected to produce some outputs. 
I don't care who they are, there's something that they're expected to do and it's important to the organization. Further, I know that that performer exists in some hierarchy of performers. Further, I know that they are part of some function that exists to produce something for other functions as part of the total organization which is producing yet something else for some outside source, some market, some recipient. Right? Just know that. Another piece is that I know that these people don't just stack up uh, there in an abstract form, but they in fact exist to make some <coughs> fundamental basic business process work. Some process to produce inputs into outputs which then contribute to the function output. All right? There's always something fundamental there. It's a billing process, it's a sales process, it's a manufacturing process, it's a scheduling process, I don't care what it is, there is something there that's important, that's key to the function. Also know, based on what we talked about last night, that every one of these performers exists in this mythical thing called the human performance system. That's also another piece of this performance context. So now when somebody says to me, fix them, the blue outline of the world <coughs> pops up, and I begin to ask the question about, minimally, what's not coming out the other end, so that I can be sure I fixed on that. Then I want to look and see how this human performance system factors into this. Next, I want to see really what's not happening at the process level because I'm not even sure that I've got the right performer here. I want to, in fact, be sure that it isn't this performer or this performer or all these performers in order to impact this process. And I also want to make sure that we're dealing with something that's of significance to the organization out here because if, in fact, it is not, all the training back here is likely not to be supported because it doesn't mean anything. It's not for real because it's not an organization consequence. We spent a lot of time last night talking about consequences to performers, which is key, but if that isn't linked to real organization consequences, you can kiss it goodbye. All right? So ideally, when someone comes to me with a training request and says, fix them, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the blue view of the world in my head, the, the performance context. So. Part of how I got to this over the years is the question of, you know, and when, when someone says, let's train them, or let's find out what training they need, and uh, you go talk to someone and they say, well, they need training. You go talk to them, they say, well, they need training. Uh, and you train these people and say, it's terrific, my boss should have been here. And, uh, and we go through all that. So the question sort of becomes, whose perception of reality do we believe? Do I believe as a trainer? And uh, where we've gotten at over the years is that the only perception that can really be trusted, the only reality that can really be trusted, is the organization performance requirements reality. Is if we step outside this hierarchy and we say, hey, why does this function exist? What happens when this function malfunctions? Okay. <coughs> and we begin to identify that. Then we can move in and say, hey, which process is significant? And then we can move up and say, Hey, which performer is involved here? One of the things in this linkage I didn't, I didn't mention that I should is basic assumption is that this performer exists, and this is relatively clear, this performer exists to drive this process, to make it work, to make the billings work, to handle the sales, whatever it is. It's not as clear, but, it's, but it is, it's clear to me that this performer in turn exists to make this performer effective in interacting with this process to get the work done. And this performer exists to help this performer be effective helping this performer be effective, all right? So we build the reality up from the bottom. So that's how the, tr the kind of the linkage is built in my mind, starting out here with what's important. You know, these people can be talking about what they think is important. The reality that seems to have the most power in talking to organizations is to step outside and talk about first the organization reality, then move in and make it work that way. Okay, so what I want to and, and the contrast between the, the blue and the red is basically the red is a subject matter driven training and the blue is performance driven training. Uh, the red is input and the blue is an output. And what I would like to do is explore the blue view with you in the next period of time, kind of where that comes from, give you some the framework for that, and then take an example through that, 
that, that blue framework. Okay, the uh, starting point for this in, uh, in my mind is a very basic thing called a general systems model, a basic view of the world. We did some work on this years ago <coughs> back in Michigan, and it's a model that's always served me well in the last few years. We've begun to teach it more and more to managers. We taught it to trainers for years, and now we're going to teach it to managers, and it's uh, been, been quite effective. Basically, the model says that you can look at the world as being basically made up of systems, and that systems have got these components. We've always got a processing system which takes in inputs and produces outputs. Of course, being in the engineering business that you're in, that's, that's a, a fundamental. And when we talk about systems, people frequently draw this diagram. And uh, we've got a form of feedback here. We look at our output, we get the feedback coming back to our processing system, which allows us to guide our output. And, uh, and so it goes. An addition here that's important to me is to understand, as we look at the world, that virtually every processing system has a receiving system, by definition, which is to say that every output is, in fact, an input to some place, which is easy to forget, particularly in organizations. We get so excited about the wonderfulness of our outputs that we can lose track of the fact that there's supposed to be significant inputs to somebody else. Right? So we've got a receiving system, and then We've got feedback in the receiving system back to our processing system, back to our control box, that says, in effect, so what? And uh, that's the ultimate test coming from, from our market, if you will. Did our, our wonderful output make any difference? This loop allows us to have a guided system. This loop allows our system to be adaptive, to change our outputs depending on the demands, the requirements of our particular receiving system. All right, that's a fundamental systems view of the organization, of the world, that we want to use at two levels. One, to look at, at organizations, and then later, to take a look at people. So, apply it directly to, to uh, organizations, and this is kind of a macro view, systems view, of an organization as, a syst as systems. Organizations as adaptive systems, as a matter of fact. Any business exists in this general environment, takes in inputs, produces outputs of products and services that go to a marketplace. Always competition that exists, and competition both for our market and for our resources. And this whole thing then, this whole continuing systems of activity is carried out in the general context of environmental influences such as government, economy, culture, etc. Right, the key here is the reality is that organizations as systems adapt. They adapt to the change in marketplace or they go out of business. All right? That is a fundamental piece. One of the things that's really key in the states right now uh, is to look at this and to point out to most organizations that this is about all you can say about many businesses in the United States and probably in North America today. That is, this is all you can say about your business now and in the future, that there's going to be a marketplace, there are going to be products and services that meet that marketplace needs, there's going to be some process to produce those outputs, they're going to be built on some inputs. That's about all we know for sure. There's going to be a marketplace if we're lucky, we're going to have products and services that that marketplace wants, we're going to have processes, and we're going to have the necessary inputs. Beyond that, we can't be very specific. In a lot of industries today, in the, in the financial services and the banking industry, as I understand it, something like 60 to 70 percent of the products and services that are being produced today did not exist 10 years ago. In the insurance business, that's clearly the case. Something like 50 percent of the products that they sell today did not exist six years ago. There's two forms of insurance. Uh, when you talk to the Japanese, they, they're very, very astute about this whole thing. They say, yes, we're making radios, but we're not in the business of making radios. We're in the business of being in business. And we just happen to be making radios right now because there's a market for that, and we've got the appropriate resources so we can meet that market need, et cetera. But we're ready to move, all right? I mean, it's a commitment 
to adaptiveness. We talked about the flexibility uh, requirements on training. Uh, here's requirements on, on organization. The only thing that varies is how fast organizations are going to have to adapt to those changes. Now, in your business, you're not going to have the radical changes. You're not going to be necessarily in a different business in 10 years. But it's conceivable that because of changing demands on the part of the marketplace, you're going to have different variations on your services, et cetera, et cetera. It's no longer the stable kind of business that it used to be. So that's a key thing, a reality about organizations if we take a look at this sort of macro view. One of the things that's one of my favorite stories about the adaptiveness of organizations uh, is to take a look at the U.S. auto business. It's a reality, which is, takes in all these good things, goes through a series of subsystems of engineering and design, manufacturing, distribution, sales, marketing, produces vehicles out here into the marketplace, which consists of first of dealers, and then of consumers. Okay. Nineteen seventy two and seventy three I was working with General Motors, in effect talking about the same kinds of things that we're talking about here in this conference, performance based training. And uh, it was relatively difficult, nigh on impossible, to get any changes in the training organization in General Motors in nineteen seventy two. They said, only mildly facetiously to me at that time, General Motors is the most successful corporation in the history of civilization. And in fact, their, their corporate air force, jet fleet, made them the third or fourth largest air force in the free world uh, at that particular time. They were the classic example of don't fix it, it ain't broken. We must be doing something right, look at all the money we're making, etc., etc. That's in 1972. Just to use the systems model for a second and go back and talk a little bit about the advent of the small car as a consumer. Think that that came about in, what, in the early 60s. Uh, people were clamoring for, for small cars in 1960, 61, uh, one of those years in October, kind of just uh, coincidentally, the big three all came out with their first small cars within a two week period. And uh, I don't know what they were called here, but they were called the Valiant, the Falcon, and the Corvair in the States, all right? so. Small cars go into the marketplace. Now, one of the things that's important in terms of the feedback that auto companies use in terms of their internal criteria is they look at how much they've got a system of counting their beans such that uh, they're convinced that, that they can't make money on small cars. Their whole system is scaled around the weight of the car. And uh, they can tell you that if a car weighs X number of, of pounds, they're going to make this many dollars. It makes X plus, et cetera, and they've, they've used that internally. So their internal criteria is based on those kinds of measures. So what happens when we get to small cars in 1961 and 62? What's, what happens the first two years? Well, characteristic of all the small cars was that they were a small car for one model year only, all right? Maybe two model years. They become six inches longer the next time they come out become 300 pounds heavier, 500 pounds heavier, and they grow, all right? Elephantitis of the automobile or something. So in fact, by the time they killed the Mustang One, it was the size of a Lincoln, as I, re as I recall, okay? We say, damn it all, we really want small cars. So they say, all right, we'll give you some more small cars. So in 65, we got the second attempt at this. We got the, the uh, Chevy Two, and I don't know, another whole thing, but the same characteristic, all right? Small car, only one model a year, and away it goes. Auto companies giveth, and the auto companies taketh. It's just simple as that. Uh, in Iacocca's book, he talks about uh, the fact that when McNamara was president of Ford and they introduced the Falcon, it was they sold more cars than any other new car ever introduced in the history of the automobile business. That's the good news. The bad news was they made less money than any new car ever introduced in the history of the automobile business. And it kind of tells you. That's another reason why McNamara went to Vietnam. 
<laughs> so, it's that old balance of consequences thing we're talking about. Okay. In 1973, interesting event called the oil embargo begins to impact the marketplace, certainly the automobile process and the resources it takes to build automobiles. Sitting out here, been some competition, basically the Volkswagen in those days, and uh, people bought a few of those, but not a lot. Starting 1973, 74, and 75, with this change in the oil thing, this market begins to change. I, for one, living in the east coast of the United States and New Jersey, was not excited about getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and driving my car down to the gas station so I could be somewhere in the first mile of the line when the station opened at 6 o'clock, and so when it ran out of gas at 7 o'clock, and that, that kind of thing, right? Now, the kids were kind of into that, because they would go out at 2 o'clock and boogie all night long in the gas line, but it didn't do, didn't do a lot for me. So the next time... <laughs> and then, when... When the gas station attendants started carrying revolvers in order to deal with the unruly masses, which, you know, I got a little spooked by that. That was, it was not the segment of society that I expected to see first armed to deal with a, a, a domestic issue. So the next time that I go out and buy an automobile, I'm looking for one that, in fact, gets lots of mileage. But by that time, not only do they get good mileage, they also hold up and they run forever. So, in fact, we now have got this thing growing, and we have got an alternative. We have got our first real honest-to-God alternative from what the big three are giving us. And, uh, and we really go for it in a big way. So now what happens in terms of this feedback loop from the receiving system back into the corporation, this thing gets to be a little erratic, all right? It's a little scary there in Detroit. I had a friend at Ford in the in the mid-70s who said you wouldn't believe the debates that are going on between the senior managers who say not to worry. It's a cyclical thing. It's happened every four years since Henry made the things, okay? Be no problem. And the younger managers and engineers who said, you know, I think this is for real. We got ourselves a real problem here. I mean, it isn't just assistant professors and graduate students driving these things. Real people are driving small cars. <laughs> so they don't know how to interpret that. When Iacocco, or not Iacocco, but DeLorean was, was president of the Chevy, as I understand it, he sent a film crew out to California, Los Angeles, and they just camped on the, on the freeway overpasses for three days and did nothing but film the rush hour traffic going in and going out, brought it back to Detroit, did a frequency count so they could try and convince management that this was a real thing and show them what was going on. Uh, all around trying to get this system to adapt. Big issue, of course, is the interpretation of that feedback coming back. Is it real or not? And it's complicated by the fact that in Michigan, I grew up in Michigan, I would go back and visit my mother in those days, that in the state of Michigan, during the 19 entire decade of the 70s, there never was a gas line longer than three cars, okay? And the auto executives, of course, all drive their cars into headquarters, they're driving company cars, you drive them downstairs in the garage and door parking, you go upstairs and work all day, while your car's down there, it's completely serviced and gassed, as part of your benefits, and you come down in the night, and get in your car, and drive home, and you don't understand what the problem is. <laughs> so we got feedback issues on, on, on all levels. Well, I don't know the details, but operationally, it would seem that the decision they made at Ford is that if you lose over $400 million for three years in a row, that's a trend. And not a <laughs> That's a trend, that's not a blip. Okay. <laughs> and now we see the drastic changes that have taken place. We got small cars for real. We got General Motors that cut the company in half and said we got a, we got a small car company and a, and a large car company. We got General Motors that's going outside and said we can't even make the things, just turning it over to the Japanese. We've got enormous changes in, in, in <coughs> management and, and uh, labor relations as a result of all that. What we in fact have got the most successful corporation in the history of civilization standing on its head and adapting to the realities of the marketplace. So it strikes me that if it can happen there, it can happen almost anywhere. Right? And it does happen 
regardless at various levels. And that's, and that's reality. So in terms of thinking about the, the piece of this then is that every organization is in fact a system, is in the reality is it's going to have to respond to its marketplace, and that's where this whole thing begins to change. And of course, as you can see, as we move in, that's going to have implications on everybody. But everything and everybody is in a, con in a systems context. Okay, we can look inside any business. We can look inside any business and we see that it is predictably made up of subsystems with key inputs and outputs that flow between those systems. In fact, that the organization, every organization is wired together as a system. I don't care what business it is, we could get up and go down the street to the insurance company, the banks, any industry we've never walked into before. And if we know that, if we go in trying to understand how it works as a system, we will see that it in fact works as a system. And that can really be key to doing our analysis further. That in fact, every subsystem is ultimately made up of processing systems. That's obvious in manufacturing because you go into a manufacturing plant, you trip over the processing system. It's less obvious when we go take a look at sales organizations, but in fact, the sales process converts prospects into outputs, just like manufacturing, uh, etc. And then we, in fact, in that general context, add people, which is what these little sparrow tracks are in here. Now, that gives me an organization systems kind of performance context for thinking about training and thinking about performance. So what frequently happens is someone comes to us and says, or to the training department and says, see that foreman? You say yes, and they say, fix him. And you say, fix him in what? And they say, well, geez, see, can't you read the papers? Fix him in quality and cost control. That's what we're all about. That's what we're concerned with. And in fact, if you look at the organization issues, they do have a problem of cost and quality around the product. All right? Now, viewing people and organizations as systems, though, prompts me to ask some questions before I go spend an awful lot of time and energy trying to fix foremen who are supposedly broken. In the context of this system, one of the things that this shows me, having this view of the organization, is that a major input into manufacturing are the designs that come out of research and development. And in fact, if I go look very closely and talk to people, I find out that frequently research and engineering and design groups design products that you can't manufacture. Or you certainly can't manufacture for the price and the quality that's been given. All right, so we've got ourselves a real, what I would call, organization disconnect in terms of a necessary input. In there. I also know that the raw materials, which go through the purchasing department, and the purchasing department is paid off frequently by getting everything a nickel a ton cheaper than last time, uh, and the fact that it doesn't work is somebody else's problem. All right? That's a factor in quality. Also, I see an input here, which is the orders that come from the sales organization. There isn't a sales organization in the world that's able to produce sales in the nice, smooth curve that they forecast them last December. All right? The whole organization is set up on the myth that we're going to run our manufacturing, we're going to run product A for three weeks, then we're going to shut down the line, we're going to convert it over, then we're going to run product B for two weeks, and then we're going to shut down the line and go back to product A, etc. In fact, what happens is we run product A for three days, and the sales department calls the marketing department, calls the production department, says, stop already. We're up to our armpits in product A, we're dying for product B. So we stop the line, we come in over time, we convert the line over, and we produce product B for a while. And in fact, we never get our curve, our cost curve down, and our quality under control, because that whole costing system is based on the assumption we're going to run it for three weeks, and we run it for three days. Okay, that's, that's organization reality. Now in the context of that, what is it that a foreman can and cannot do? Right? May very well be some important things that they can do, but I have to understand that as part of the system before I can have significant impact on that in terms of improving performance. Okay, so I think the basic thing is, uh, is that this gives us a, a, perform a, a performance context for looking at the relationship of people in the larger organization systems. This really, in terms of needs analysis, leads to the question of where has the organization system broken? In contrast to last night, we talked about where's the human performance system broken? 
this level we're talking about where is the organization system broken because if it doesn't work effectively as a system you know we just aren't going to get enough <coughs> to the people to get them to override a system that isn't terribly well put together okay so that's kind of the one level of looking at the at the world now in that in that context here <coughs> Now, we've been looking at the macro view of the organization. What we know is we can go down and take a look at any human performer, and they exist in this business of the human performance system that we talked about last night. So now, as you can see, we're taking our same systems model, but in this case, rather than looking at organizations, we're looking at people and <laughs> analyzing the people system in the same way. We're taking a, a micro look, and that's what we we worked on last night. I won't uh, spend any time on that this morning. We, the major point is that people do exist in a human performance system. These are the characteristics <coughs> of the human performance system. And the question here, as you recall, was basically in terms of our training needs analysis or our performance analysis is where has the performance system broken down. When someone comes in and says, fix it, that says something is broken. No, no argument about that. The key is in being sure that we know what's broken and we got a, a proper fix on that, all right? So we use that. That's part of our assumption at, the, at a more micro level. Of course, this picture that we also talked about last night, the only addition here is simply to say, Okay, whose performance system has broken down where? Because we may have a problem down at this level, but in fact, the issue is going to be that the consequences at the next level up here are what's causing us to have this particular problem. So we have to understand that. All right, now, if we put the system's view of organizations to, together with their system's view of people, we end up with what I call an anatomy of performance. Where we look at and see organizations as systems, and we understand that every performer in here is also part of the human performance system. So in fact, when someone brings their not feeling so well organization into Dr. Rummler's clinic, and we wheel it into the x-ray room and we put the x-ray uh, machine on, what we get back is basically this picture. What we see is that performance is a function of these things interacting, the organization system and organization disconnects and the people system and the breakdowns in the human performance system. And that really gives us then the total performance context in which to think about, fix them, train them, do whatever it is that we want to do. Okay. This is simply points out, same picture, that we have got some key performance links in organizations. Ultimately, we've got whatever the organization is producing for its market and what it has to produce in order to adapt and stay alive. We've got how the functions link to each other. We've got how any given process links to, to the performance needs of the function. We've got how the performer, the bottom links to the process and how the next level links to them. And then ultimately, that brings us back to what is it that knowledge and skill can do. So if we understand, we want to link training input to performance output, what we got to do in any given case when someone says fix them is to move out here and begin to understand the organization and how this all relates together so that we can in fact know where to come around here and see if we made a difference or ideally to start around here and say what's not happening and then what process is, fun is affecting that and what performer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, that in fact now is kind of the basic model for, for uh, linking training input to performance output. You can diagram it 
thusly. Now this, I mentioned that looking at the systems view is in effect the concept of the framework to, to think about performance in organizations and how training might impact it. This is, this <coughs> speaks to a base, to a process that can be used for, uh, for looking at this in any, any given case. Ideally, what we have is someone says, this is our organization. Where are the opportunities in our organization? It can be a division, it can be a region, et cetera. Where are our opportunities to impact organization performance? And our analysis would say, in function C, we've got ourselves a real opportunity. And specifically, in function C, one of the key processes is this particular process. So then we would drop down to what I would call the process level. And we would identify what are the process steps that impact organization performance? What are the deficiencies of these various steps? What's the impact of those deficiencies on the organization? And what's the probable cause of the breakdown of that process? So the process step is really key. It's the linking pin between organization performance and individual performance. And if we don't articulate that and understand that, we really can't make that particular linkage back. And I'll take an example and to illustrate that in a moment. But once we understand the process, and we in fact go through here and say we've got a broken process step here and here, then we can stack up our hierarchy up here and say, all right, how do each of these performers, what do they do vis-a-vis -vis each of these steps? And what are they not doing? And we can identify then that our key performer that has the most impact on our process is M2 at this level, and then we can move to a job or performer level, take a look at that job and say, okay, here's what we have to have from that job, here's what in fact we're getting, here's the cause, here are the training requirements necessary to do that. So if we train in these areas, we're gonna impact these performer outputs, which are gonna impact the process in this way, which is gonna make this kind of difference to the organization, all right? now. That's a fairly, that's the ideal, is that we start here and work through. Someone says to us, gee, where can you make the greatest difference, all right? Wouldn't you like to have an opportunity to do that? Does not happen all that much. Basically, what happens to us frequently is people come to us and they identify the performer and they say, fix them. And what this suggests here is that minimally we wanna move up the scale and at least say, okay, what's the process that that performer impacts who else impacts that, and how does that process, or how is that process malfunctioning, and how might that process impact the larger picture? <coughs> so minimally, we can work from the bottom up to at least move one or two steps, and every time we can ask more questions to move up that scale to understanding what's not working or what the opportunities are uh, in the process in the organization, we're gonna have a better chance to impact performance in the long run and to, and to evaluate our, our impact on the total organization. Okay. So that's the basic process, uh, and as I said, that, that's somewhat elaborate, but in the total context, with almost any training request coming up, I think you can approximate parts of this and get started by asking some questions about the larger context within which <coughs> something is happening or not happening. What I'd like to do now is just take an example through these steps and show you how this is done in an organization. And then we'll put a wrap on it here. I'm going to jump over one slide in here for a moment. Here's the situation. We've got you don't have this is the only picture you don't have. We have here a company like uh, an insurance company that sells property casualty insurance, all right? Everybody in the room has got some of that for your automobile, for your storm doors, your roof, whatever. And uh, this is how the organization looks in our classic sense. There's an investment management function, there's an administrative function wherein the training resides, corporate level, there's insurance operations, which is made up of <coughs> field operations that sells to agents, product development, which invents new insurance products, underwriting, which determines what the risk is when you send your policy in and they say fat chance. Yeah. And then there's the claims organization, which has regions, and then in those regions they have a series of claim offices with a manager, 
for the claim supervisor and at the bottom the claim rep. That's the person that comes out and looks at your house and snickers and, uh, and uh, <laughs> takes it back and proves there's no you know, fat chance that you'll get what you, what you want. Okay, that's the, that's the organization here to build my example on. What happens is the vice president of claims <coughs> comes to the training organization and says, in effect, fix the claim reps. And uh, specifically, what I want you to fix them in is a thing which we're going to call uh, sc scoping of damage, scoping and estimating of damage. Well, I feel that they need training in that. In fact, while you're at it, let's look at a four or five day refresher training with that being the, uh, the key thing, all right? That's the task that's presented to the training function. And the training function basically, and, and the training function comes back and says, well, really, what's, what's not happening? What's the issue? And they say, well, we got a problem with our payouts are going up, basically, and that's eroding the corporate margins, all right? That's the basic, the basic hurt, if you will, when you press on it. Now, kind of following our, our uh, model here, This training organization had an opportunity to start by taking a look at, at the claims function in the larger context of the organization and answering some questions. So what they did was, which we recommend doing, and they literally developed what we call an organization map of the company. All right? One view of the organization is as a set of functions, this classic organization chart, which tells you basically <coughs> who's doing what to whom. Does not tell you how the pieces relate together and how the work gets done. So at that, at that organization level, what we really would like to see is a map of how this thing fits as a system. Literally draw it. So just, just quickly to orient you, this is Property and Casualty Inc. It's got two markets. It's got the client market and it's got its financial market. Major subsystems in here are investment operations, which invest the bucks into this market, and insurance operations, which consists of product development, underwriting, and claims. All right, so now we see claims as one piece of this system, and what we're able to do is see who all impacts average payout. All right, it turns out Claims have some impact on payout, but product development and, how, and what they design as a policy has a major impact on it. They design a bummer. Underwriting has major impact in terms of how they set the rate, et cetera. So claims may have something to do with payout, but it's got one piece of the action. So the training department knows what the general context is. They know where they can begin to look to see how we can evaluate if our training's made any difference and all those good things. So we, in fact, establish this picture, we understand how this function relates to the total organization. And now what they're going to do is come down and begin to look at a particular function. And the function they want to look at is the claims <coughs> function, the claim handling function. Simple, basic claim process. The insured files a claim comes in here, goes through its process steps of claim qualified, claim assigned, et cetera, et cetera, comes out the other end. Important point here. This is the first time in the history of this company, and certainly it's not an issue here, but in a lot of companies it is. This is the first time in the history of this company that they ever articulated the claim process. That they ever said, this is how the claim <coughs> process ought to really work. There are hundreds of people going doing this for 60, 70 years. This is the first time we got agreement on what we want to have happen. So articulation is, is a step one and important. Step two is to find out how this process impacts payout. And it can impact the economics. Well, it can by the amount of the payout. It turns out it impacts by the timeliness of what they produce. It turns by the cost per claim of handling it within this function and customer service. So it's not just simply one thing. These, eight, these reps are balancing between four important measures. So we articulate the process, we find out how the process impacts the organization, and then we begin to analyze the process. It's very simple. Against these process steps, just like we, we talked about in our abstraction here, against these process steps, we begin to look at the deficiencies impact and probable cause, 
So we say, in effect, what's broken? What's the impact on these areas? And what's caused? Loss scoped exposure estimate. That's what the vice president wanted fixed. The analysis that the training function did in talking to claims reps, talking to claim supervisors, was to find out that that weren't no big deal. Major broken parts that impacted the economics were in here and here. These two critical steps. If they were not done right, it was downhill from that point on. You had to come back and do it over again, etc., etc. All right? So the analysis showed that what was broken is not this, but in fact here, and the impact was significant, and the cause was kind of interesting. We move up here and begin to look at this, the performers vis-a-vis -vis that process. Claim rep, claim supervisor, claims manager. Remember, it was training for these people in this area was diagnosed. In fact, what the analysis showed was that it was in this area, and in fact, the performer that impacts those areas, not the claim rep, but the claim supervisor. So if we, in fact, want to have a real difference on payout, et cetera, we got to fix something different, and we got to deal with a different level of performer than was initially diagnosed. So our analysis then links us to back to this level of performer, and we begin to see the kinds of things that have to be done. So what we can do here, the next page is just an example of, of uh, a format for talking about that process analysis. We list the process step here. Against that process step, we identify what it is the, rep is the claims rep is supposed to do, what the supervisor is supposed to do. There's a function in there I didn't mention called field support, what they're supposed to do. We can talk about the opportunities or deficiencies of each of these steps. And we can indicate how those deficiencies impact these important areas of payout cost claims. So we, we are able to make the link between organization concerns to the process, and not only that, but from the process step that might be broken to some particular performer. We get that kind of comprehensive view of the whole business. Then our last step in this whole thing is once we've identified, in this case, that our claim supervisor is where we ought to be looking, we now can move down here and say, let's take a closer look at what we want to have happen from our claim supervisors and what training is required and what other <coughs> kinds of things are required. In the basic format, we, we talk about that as a job model. And so here, now, for the claim supervisor, for these major accomplishments or outputs, of the process, here's what we got to have from the supervisor. Here's how we might measure it. Here are the standards. Here's current discrepancies and impact. Knowledge skill causes and environmental causes. That's what we pick up consequences and feedback in here. So we in fact go forth to management with a comprehensive view of key performers, how they impact the business, what has to be done to change their performance, both in terms of knowledge skill and changes in the environment that we've picked up, the training people have picked up in this particular study. All right, so we've moved from fixed claim reps to understanding how the function fits in the total organization, to looking at the process, finding out it's broken in a different place, find out that we've got different performers we should be concerned with, to now taking a comprehensive look at what it would take to make that performer effective. And of course, we could build job models for the claim rep also if we wanted to. And that becomes the key to putting together our training. Whole business in this example gets summarized in this chart, which has probably got more on it than any chart you've ever seen in your life. But let me show you what it's, what it's trying to do here. It really provides us with a comprehensive look at the areas. What we have across the top are the steps in our, in our process, in a little more detail than I showed you earlier, but this is our claim process. <coughs> this indicates how each of those steps what 
what factors, performance factors, each of those steps impact. So step three or four here, claim qualified, impacts cost per claim, timeliness, customer service. And that's cut one. <coughs> then against that, in terms of areas for improvement, we've stacked up our important areas. Supervisor, the rep, the process itself, the agent, it turns out, is a contributor to this. And we've said for each of these performers or functions, here's what's required in a way of training and support. So we've, in fact, got on one page a prescription for management that says, if you really want to make a difference in your payouts, here's what we got to do. And of course, it makes the point, which we all know, that if we just go in and fix one of these for one performer, we're never going to get what's critical out the other end. So, and, and I agree.